Great. All right, why don't we get started? A lot of logistics before this talk. Welcome. I'm so pleased to see this turnout. Um, as they say on the airlines, we know you have choices in your choice of airlines, and we're pleased you've chosen to fly uh, Barnett and Blackman uh, for your, uh, af your, your, uh, your afternoon or your noontime uh, in entertainment. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're here to talk about our brand new book, uh, which drops today, introduction, an introduction to constitutional law. Copies are for sale. 100 Supreme Court cases that everyone should know. The fact that copies are for sale here is no small matter because Amazon sold out of this book last week. Uh, it is now saying it's a one month to three month delivery. I'm very, very hopeful that's not the case, but uh, I don't know when they'll actually deliver. So the fact that we actually have some copies here is a big plus. Normally, if I'm a student, I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to buy it on Amazon. I'm not going to buy the copies they have. But you might think about buying the copies that, that we have here. Okay. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, it's been a long two years of collaborating with Josh on this. I should just say, you can, you'll get some sense of that right now. Um, the, uh, it's, this is actually a project that is two years in the making. As I was saying, I added Josh to my casebook. He proposed that we do a flipped classroom approach. This meant uh, writing scripts um, and filming um, uh, what ended up being 63 videos. Uh, in order to preview the materials that you would study in class and preview the materials uh, that are in the, in the textbook. Um, and it's been a very uh, rewarding and in, uh, en engaging and a very draining experience uh, to do all that. And uh, Josh is also responsible for all the uh, post-production uh, work, which includes a lot of illustrations and clips, which we'll show you a sample of. He'll show you a sample of. What, I'm, what my part of this talk is going to be about is the basic approach to constitutional law that we take um, in this book, um, and it is what has been sometimes called the canonical cases approach. In my view, constitutional law is somewhat different as a subject than other uh, law school subjects like contracts, which I also teach and which I also have a case book in. Contracts um, is best understood as a set of doctrines or rules and, in my view, also the theories that explain why the rules are the way they are. So to study contracts, uh, in depth, you need to ex expose yourself both to the doctrine and you also need to expose yourself to the underlying theory about why we have the doctrine we have. Uh, constitutional law is somewhat different. The rules or doctrine that the Supreme Court produces is, in my view, somewhat secondary to the way that they think. Um, they think in terms of narrative. Uh, constitutional law can be thought of as a continuous story that starts at the founding and works its way to the present, and the featured characters in the story are really of two different kinds. One are the justices themselves. Uh, the composition of the court changes over time, as you know, and as the composition changes, so, do, so does the, the story. Um, and so they are characters, and the other characters are the cases themselves. Which cases? Not every case. Uh, but what's called the canonical cases. And we didn't make up this phrase. This is a phrase that has become sort of popular amongst constitutional scholars. What is a canonical case? A canonical case is a case that is widely recognized um, and accepted as, in some sense, the gospel, the well-decided good cases, the cases that are to be emulated, the cases that, if you're litigating in the area, you need to bring your lawsuit underneath those cases. And those are to be contrasted with the anti-canonical cases, which are those. Those are the cases that are reviled and despised. Those are the cases that you try to paint your opponent's case as being somewhat similar to those cases, if you can possibly do that. Um, and so what are the, it's, it's almost easier to, uh, to give you examples of the anti-canonical cases, like Dred Scott or Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, these are obviously cases that are famous and which you really need to know but you really need to know that they're bad. Um, then it would be nice to know why they're bad and how they came to be bad. Now, every constitutional lawyer uh, who practices constitutional law, as I have, eventually learns this story, the story of the Supreme Court and the story of the canonical cases. This is something we all know. And I think most constitutional law, uh, law stu most students of constitutional law do pick it up. They, it's not like it's hidden from them. But the way con law is typically structured in your classes, um, it's hard to pick it up. Why? Because most of the casebooks are organized around doctrines. 
first you're going to study this doctrine, then you're going to study that doctrine, then you're going to study the next doctrine. And when you study the law doctrine by doctrine, you lose a sense of what the overall narrative has been. When did this doctrine exactly get introduced and when did that change get introduced? If you're studying everything like in a silo, one doctrine at a time, the timing of everything is very hard to understand. And eventually, I think you kind of get it, but it's really hard. The more efficient way of learning this is to study these cases chronologically in the order in which they were decided. And this is what our textbook does. This is a book that you, should, that you can buy to read before you take constitutional law or as you're taking constitutional law. Uh, Josh knows the figure, but how, what our overlap is between the cases we discuss and all the case books that are out there. Okay. Yeah, with 70 or 80 percent overlap of the cases we talk about versus the cases that you will talk about in your classes, no matter what case book your professor uses. So what we do is we present this narrative. We do it in two parts. We do it in part one, our, which is constitutional structure, and we do it in part two in terms of constitutional rights, which just happens coincidentally to correspond to the way Georgetown structures their con law one and con law two classes. Just a coincidence. I don't know how that happened. Um, but it's a happy coincidence for those people in this room. Uh, and so by telling you the overarching narrative, um, you get to understand exactly when these cases were decided, why they were decided the way they were, the composition of the courts that, 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 that led to these decisions. Um, and, and, so, and that is a narrative that develops over time. So in a way, what we're presenting to you um, are 100 individual stories which is each one of the cases, and how they fit into a larger story of the Supreme Court and of the growth of constitutional law. This is not a book about originalism. It's not a book about the original meaning of the text of the Constitution, um, which is what my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, is about. We do talk about original meaning in a few videos as a setup to talking about the constitutional doctrines that develop. But this is a, this is a book about constitutional law, which is the law that's made by the Supreme Court. Um, so I guess with that, uh, Josh, do you want to uh, talk about the flipped classroom? Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in Georgetown. Uh, thank you all so much. Okay. Oh, you flipped my mic. correspond to our case book. We have this book that's almost 2,000 pages long, covers upwards of 200 cases. And I thought, let's record these short three to five minute videos discussing every case. And I pitched this idea to Randy. And to his credit, I mean this sincerely, he thought, that's a good idea. Let's, let's talk about it. And we had discussions. And then we had to persuade our publisher. Now, publishers aren't the most innovative people. Their business is making books, after all. They, you know, they, are, they are creating a product that is dwindling in sales. And we have to persuade them that there is a value in changing the way students learn about constitutional law. And to our surprise and happiness, the publisher approved a pilot project back in 2017, where we, we recorded about eight videos short videos. Um, we then had to find a studio. We had to write the scripts. We had to do the storyboarding. And we put together this, this, this presentation of how you could discuss a given con law case in about four to five minutes. But we realized we had something more powerful, right? That these videos would not simply be a supplement to our casebook, which costs $400 and one supply. Um, we thought, what if we actually made a standalone product? And this is Randy's innovation here. Right? We had these scripts we were writing. And we realized, Randy said, we can make these scripts into a book. Right? The very chapters of the books, which is for sale over there, 3175, that you can buy in an autograph view, these very chapters came from the scripts in the video. And what if we allow people who 
buy the book, get a little scratch off code, which they can use to access the videos online. Right? What if we do that? And then it became this mission to create videos from more than a dozen cases. And we came up with a list of the cases we thought everyone should know. Now, the number 100 sounds great. We didn't know it was 100 when we started. I actually just made a list and I counted. It was like 103. I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty close to 100. So we actually came up with this list without even knowing what 100 were. But we distilled these cases to the 100 cases that everyone we think should know. And we actually checked with other case books, the Bress Levinson, the Chemerinsky, Stone Simon, whatever case book you use, I can promise you that at least 60 or 70% are in our book. Right? We have a huge overlap. So this will not be a book that's only for Barnett Blackman. This is not a book for originalists either. I think Randy was very honest to say that. We did not want to make this a federal study handbook. That's not what this book is. Uh, we tried to make this as neutral as possible, which is not easy. In fact, we got a blurb from Dean Erwin Chemerinsky of the Berkeley Law School, who agrees with us on basically zero. I think we're really close to zero, but a little more than zero. We have blurbs from people like Sandy Levinson and, and Jack Balkan at Yale, Michael Dorff at Cornell. Right? These are people who don't agree with us on substantive issues, but recognize the value of this book. That's why we wrote it. Now, let me talk about the flipped classroom for a bit. Um, how do most students learn? It's fairly predictable. The professor gives a syllabus, read pages 1 through 30 before class, come to class, talk about four or five cases, and go home and never talk about it ever again. Right? That's what law school is. Um, the flipped classroom operates in a different fashion. Uh, this is something that innovated not in law school, not in college, but in primary education. And the notion is you flip things. Instead of having the substantive learning in the classroom, you flip it. You put the learning at home using video. So students can actually watch lectures before they come to class. And what's the benefit of that approach? When you get to class, you can dive deeper into the materials. When you already have a solid foundation of what you've learned, you can flip the entire nature of learning. And I'll give you a few easy examples. Right? Generally, when a professor says, let's talk about case Margaret versus Madison, what's the first question? Right? What's the first question the professor always ask? <coughs> what are the facts? Right? <coughs> How much time is spent on drilling out the facts of a case? Depending on the case, quite a lot. That's not very useful. Right? You spend more time on figuring out what the case or what the facts of the case are than actually discussing what the case means sometimes. You spend so much time saying, and who was the plaintiff, who was the defendant, then what was the posture, and what happened in the lower court. It, it, it's, I, I hate those questions. They're not very useful. You don't learn anything from them. Right? The flip classroom says we do it differently. Right? We will give you these short videos, these short videos that recite the facts for you that tell you who the parties are, where they're coming from, what's their grievance, why are they in court, what did the lower court hold. And when you get to class, you can then dive deep in to explain the court's rule. <coughs> How did the dissent respond? Where does this case fit into the bigger picture of constitutional law? Um, you know, Randy Peaches at Georgetown, you're all students of national acclaim. Um, but I think Randy will test that this is modified the way he teaches his class. That you can shift some things into the homework and then use that additional class time to proceed. And even in schools that aren't like Georgetown, right? And, and, and again, all schools have different characters. Students benefit from this approach um, if it's done right. And that's where we come in. Uh, most videos suck, right? If you go through YouTube, it's mostly garbage. And I think people will agree. Um, it's very hard to make engaging content that holds someone's attention for three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Think, how often do you start a video and click, ah, never mind, right? How often do you actually click to the end of the video? I think very rarely, right? Um, what we try to do is make it engaging. To actually put together a video that students will actually want to watch from start to finish, and not just because they have to, because Barnett assigned it for his students, right? Uh, but because they want to. Okay, how did we do that? We started with the basic principle, we want to have media. Um, the cases at the Supreme Court are rich. 
They have very uh, famous parties involved. These people, if they're more recent, are in video, or interviews. If they're older, maybe they're paintings, and then maybe they're portraits. Uh, maybe a case of also a piece of property, there are maps we can use, photographs. Uh, maybe a case was argued after the 1950s, which point there were uh, microphones in the Supreme Court. We have audio. We have audio of the oral argument. We have audio of the handout. What's the handout? People don't know about this. When the justices announce their opinion, they read a short summary from the bench. Those are recorded. We have all of those in our videos. So rather than Josh and Randy telling you what a case says, well, Justice Scalia explain what it says. Right? I can tell you about Morris and Olson, or Scalia can read the dissent. We have Justice Kennedy talking about the sweet mysteries of human life. Right? Whatever the topic is, we have the audio. But even more than that, we present the cases in a way that most people never thought about them. Right? You learn. Okay, we learn about numerated powers today, then we do you know, due process, then we do First Amendment. But I want you to think about the arc of constitutional law told not by topic, but by chronology. How many of you have actually sorted common law cases by date? I never even thought about it. That in the same time the Supreme Court's deciding cases on due process, we're also deciding cases on separation of powers, right? So. What we did, we built this website, which is not public yet, called conlaw.us. And we can sort cases by topic, but I also want to walk through 100 cases chronologically. I won't do all 100. You told me not to. I'm going to do a figure. We get along very well. So. <laughs> and you start with the J court. Okay? And the very first case is one of Randy's favorites, which is Chisholm against Georgia. How many of you actually read Chisholm Warren in Randy's class? Oh, that's it. None of you. This is a this was the Supreme Court's first major constitutional case, which concerns sovereign immunity. Right? Can a state be sued? Now the next few cases you probably all read chronologically. Marbury, did McCulloch, did Gibbon, Barron, right? These were the basic cases of the Roberts Court. But after that, you probably don't think about chronology much. You go to the Tawny Court, right? Three important cases, all involving slavery and the Civil War. How many of you group these together? Creek, which is about the Fugitive Slave Act, Dred Scott and Sanford, and Ex parte Maryland, all decided in the span of about 15 years. Then we go on to Samuel Chase, who was one of Randy's icons, mentioned the Chase Lecture, right? The Chase Court had these foundational cases after the Civil War. DeWitt was about the scope of enumerated powers. Pepper versus Griswold and Knox Lee was about paper money. Did you read these cases? Or were in Randy's class? Probably not. These are foundational cases at the scope of congressional power. In post-Civil War, we have the slaughterhouse cases. And Bridal versus Illinois, the privileges for reading these laws. And then we have the Reconstruction cases from the Wake Court. Chief Justice Morrison Wake, which I never heard of before. Crookshank was from the Colfax Massacre, about whether the right to bear arms is a fundamental privilege for immunity. Stroud was about the right to have a non-segregated jury. And the civil rights cases was about whether Congress can eradicate discrimination. And of course, Jacob B. Hopkins about set a discrimination against Asian businesses in San Francisco. And we went to the progressive era with the Justice Fuller Court. And these cases are usually not combined in one. But at the same time, you have a case like Lochner, which was a famous due process case. You also have Champion B. Ames and E.C. Knight. These are cases at the scope of Congress's powers. At the same time, the court was wrestling with whether Congress can regulate sort of local activity, the court also wrestled with the police power of the state to have the same activity. Move on to the white court, which was primarily in World War I. We have their first amendment cases, Schenck, Debs, and Abrams, about the rights to protest, the right to object to government practices. These were very early first amendment cases. And the Taft court, the 1920s, right? And these cases involve the due process clause. Not always the same way. You had Miami, Nebraska, and Pierce had the right of families to raise children. We also have Buck v. Bell, which upheld the forced sterilization of Carrie Buck. At the same time, we have Acton versus Children's Hospital, which is a famous due process case from here in DC about whether a minimum wage is constitutional. Right? In the same year, you have Miami, Nebraska, you also have Atkins, both due process cases. Unless you pair them in this chronology, it doesn't even make sense that they would ever be together. Then we move on to pre and post New Deal. And this was a 
transformational period in American history. The court radically changed how it reviewed laws involving both federal and state powers. Now, many of you probably studied a case called West Coast Hotel versus Parrish. Right? This was a case that whether a Washington minimum wage law was valid. And maybe you studied that the reason why this case was decided the way it was was because of President Roosevelt. Maybe you learned that President Roosevelt threatened to pack the court. And Justice Owen Roberts, not John Roberts, Owen Roberts, uh, changed his vote, changed his vote to avoid a court patent scheme and upheld a minimum wage law. That's not the correct narrative of American history. In fact, the story begins before Roosevelt was elected, the case of Little Gorman, where the court upheld a New Jersey law regulating contracts and how much commissions can be paid. And when you study this chronology, you see it didn't start in 37, it started in 31 with the progressive Hoover appointees. At the same time, we have Schechter Poultry, a case you should now know with Justice Gorsuch's dissent in Gundy. This case involved the non-delegation doctrine and whether the executive can make laws. So in the span of a couple of years, you go from uh, O'Gorman to Schechter Poultry to West Coast Hotel, you see there were different treatments of state and federal laws. Of course, when you get to Darby, I'm sorry, Jones and Laughlin Steele, and Carolyn Price and Darby, the court begins to expand the scope of federal power with the so-called substantial effects test. But we wouldn't really see the breadth of federal power until 1942 with Wicker against Gilbert. This case introduced what the aggregation principle, the notion that even local activity that has no effect on interstate commerce can be aggregated together and then everything together nationwide might affect commerce substantially, Congress can then regulate the local activity. And within two years, though, a wicker gets four months of the famous Japanese detention case, I should say. Uh, the Vincent Court was not very long and not very successful. Only had one important case at a diggie, which is Youngstown Machine 2 Company, about whether the president could seize the steel mills. Okay. So far, the cases are fairly sporadic. And then we get to the Warren Court. This is Chief Justice Earl Warren, who had uh, probably the most significant chief justiceship in American history. And think of it this way, right? You have Brown and Bowling B. Sharp at school desegregation. And then you have the case that blamed to be the optical, right, in the span of short time. Where in the context of due process in Bowling B. Sharp, there's this broad notion that courts can review laws. But in Williams to be the optical, the court says, no, 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 for economic regulations, we will defer to the executive branch. And you're seeing this schism form where certain types of rights are favored and other rights are not favored. Then we get to the 1960s with a lot of cases involving civil rights. A Sherbert versus Verner was an important free exercise case. So whether a Seventh day Adventist could be denied benefits for refusing to work on the Sabbath, or at least in that case, it was the Saturday. You have New York Times against Sullivan's famous First Amendment defamation case. Then we have the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Butter Land and Katzen Act. And Congress prohibits segregation in place of public accommodation. And then not even a year after, you have Grizzle v. Connecticut, where the court seems to suggest, well, maybe substantive due process isn't so bad when it involves birth control. Then you have Loving versus Virginia, about whether Virginia can ban interracial marriage and it'll drive by draft card burning. And these cases presented chronologically paint the picture of the time. The 60s were a chaotic year, and thankfully it wasn't there. But <laughs> uh, we're, we're friends. But <laughs> you can see how the civil rights movement how the sexual revolution, how the anti-war protesters, all these sorts of cultural themes merge in these years that the cases reflect what's going on in the world around them. Then we go into the 1970s with the Burger Court, which was a, not a long court, but had some important cases. The first of which was, of course, Roe v. Wade, cases involving abortion. It wasn't just involving abortion. You had Frontier of Richardson, which Ruth Ginsburg argued, and Craig v. Boren, about whether the protection clause prohibits gender-based discrimination. And you have Buckley against Vallejo, which was an important campaign finance, which that Senator Frank Buckley uh, from, from New York. I'm sorry, William Buckley, Frank Buckley, that means William Buckley. Then you have Bakke, the, the affirmative action case, decided the James, same. James Buckley. Oh, William Buckley's an after you got. Thank you. <laughs> but the same thing of Bakke, which is an affirmative action case, you have Penn Central an important state in the state, right? Um, then not much in the 1980s of Cleveland, which was a case involving uh, 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 protection for a mentally handicapped individual. 
But then we go to what I think is the biggest portion of our book. Uh, the Rehnquist Court, for one reason or another, had so many significant cases. I think it's about a quarter of our book, even though it's only about 25 <clears throat> years. And the Rehnquist Court was very heavy on federalism. That was sort of a mantra of the Rehnquist Court. Uh, we have, of course, South Dakota v. Dole, which was the power of Congress to nudge the state to raise their drinking age by withholding highway funds. Uh, that's Ted Olson, of course. In the case of Morrison against Olson, of the constitutionality of the independent council. That precedent may not be long for the world. Uh, Texas versus Johnson was about flag burning. Employment Division versus Smith was about the free exercise clause, whether a person uses peyote can be denied benefits. Then we have the federalism case, New York versus the United States, right? Can Congress force a state to regulate its radioactive waste? You have Planned Parenthood versus Casey, abortion. You have Church of the Lukumi, which is free exercise. We have Lopez, right? We have Morrison, we have Prince, all the power of Congress to regulate local activity and state officials. And we keep going. We have Gratz and Grutter, which is affirmative action. We have Lawrence against Texas, which is a uh, 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 sodomy laws in, in, uh, in Texas. And of course, in case I'll get to in a minute, Gonzalez versus Raich, which is a decision that Randy argued that in the body. And of course, we have Kilo from McCreary County. Finally, we move on to the Roberts Court. This is a not yet finished court. It's still ongoing, and we're not quite sure where it's going to lead. And I think with its few most recent appointees, it may swish and turn in various directions. But we have cases decided like Heller, Second Amendment, McDonald, Second Amendment in the States. We have a trio of First Amendment cases, Stevens, Snyder, and Brown, that have different powers of the state to regulate um, uh, sort of offensive conduct. The case ran you know, all too well, which was the Obamacare decision in 2012. We have Fisher, which is a firm action case. Windsor, a defensive marriage act. Hobby Lobby, a burger bonus gay marriage. And our last two cases, Fisher II, decided after Justice Scalia died. And the very most recent case is Pullman's Health versus Hellerstedt. Now, that sounds like a lot, and, and it is. Uh, it's about 300 pages to go through the entire history of the book. But let's say you don't like to read. You're jail, right? If you don't like to read, you can also watch videos. And I want to show you one of the videos. This is a world preview. Uh, we've not played this publicly before, so you get a little sneak preview. I want to play the Gonzalez versus Rage video, which is a case that Randy argued back in 2005. In 1996, California voters passed the Compassionate Use Act, which legalized marijuana for medical use. California's law conflicted with the Federal Controlled Substances Act, or CSA, which banned the cultivation, possession, and distribution of marijuana. In 1998, the federal government sued to enjoin the operation of the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative. I became one of the lawyers representing the OCBC. We argued that the CSA exceeded Congress's powers under the Commerce Clause. However, there was an obstacle to our claim. Since money in marijuana was changing hands in the cooperative, this was clearly economic activity. My co-counsel, Robert Rach, suggested that we should bring a lawsuit in which marijuana was neither bought nor sold, but merely gifted. I wholeheartedly agreed. As it happened, Rob's wife, Angel Rach, was suffering from several intractable illnesses, including a brain tumor, which had caused a wasting syndrome. Her weight loss threatened her life until a nurse suggested she try marijuana. Using marijuana allowed her to gain weight and strength. Our legal team brought a civil suit to enjoin the application of the CSA to Angel Rage, as well as to Diane Monson, who used medical marijuana to relieve her back pains and spasms, which had not responded to conventional therapy. Critically, neither plaintiff purchased marijuana. Angel's caregivers grew the marijuana and gave it to her at no charge. Diane grew her own plants and thus did not have to buy it. Therefore, we contended that under the limiting principle established by Lopez and Morrison, Congress could not regulate this entirely intrastate, non-economic activity. And because we took care that no items used to cultivate the marijuana had ever traveled in interstate commerce, there was no jurisdictional hook. Although we lost in the Northern District of California, we prevailed in the Ninth Circuit, and the Supreme Court granted cert. 
Before the Supreme Court, the Bush administration was represented by Solicitor General Paul Clement. He argued that the local cultivation of marijuana is economic activity because homegrown marijuana substituted for marijuana that could have been purchased in the interstate marketplace. For example, because Roscoe Filburn grew wheat on his own farm to feed his livestock, he did not need to purchase that wheat on the interstate marketplace. Likewise, because Diane Monson grew her own marijuana, she did not have to buy marijuana on the interstate marketplace. This framework was known as the market substitute theory. We responded that Wickard was distinguishable. Unlike Angel and Diane, Roscoe Filburn was engaged in commercial farming, which was an economic activity. Furthermore, if anything that serves as a substitute for goods or services obtained in the market can be considered economic, there would be no limit on Congress's power because nearly any activity we do for ourselves can also be provided by a commercial service. And the Supreme Court in Lopez had already rejected any theory of enumerated powers that lacked a limiting principle. During oral argument, some of the justices seemed open to the market substitute theory. Justice David Souter suggested that whether or not an activity was economic depends on whether it had an economic effect on the national economy. He then equated the economic effect on the interstate market of Angel and Diane's homegrown marijuana with that of Roscoe Filburn's homegrown wheat. If there would be a large market effect, it makes no more sense to call this non-economic than Filburn's use. To this, I responded that Lopez and Morrison stood for the proposition that the mere fact that activities may have an economic effect on the market does not make them economic activities. To identify whether an activity is economic, you have to look to the activity itself. But an economic activity is one that's associated with sale, exchange, barter, the production of things for sale and exchange, barter. So for example, you, prostitution is an economic activity. Marital relations is not an economic activity. We could be talking about virtually the same act. We don't say that because there is a market for prostitution, that therefore everything that has an effect on the market because it substitutes for what can be obtained in the market is itself economic activity. After this exchange, the justices dropped the market substitute conception of economic activity. Ultimately, the court ruled for the government by a vote of six to three. The four progressive justices were joined by two of the conservative justices from the Lopez and Morrison majority, Justices Kennedy and Scalia. In his majority opinion, Justice Stevens did not adopt the government's market substitution theory of economic effect. Instead, he relied on Webster's third New International Dictionary's definition of economic as, quote, the production, distribution, and consumption of commodities. Because Angel's caregivers and Diane were engaged in the activity of producing marijuana, according to Webster's third, they were engaged in economic activity. So under Morrison and Lopez, Congress could regulate their activity. For this reason, the CSA was constitutional as applied to cultivating marijuana locally. Justice Stevens also adopted an alternative holding. Chief Justice Rehnquist's majority opinion in Lopez mentioned that the Gun-Free School Zones Act was not, quote, an essential part of a larger regulation of economic activity in which the regulatory scheme could be undercut unless the intrastate activity were regulated. Therefore, Justice Stevens found that, quote, Congress has the power to regulate purely local activities when necessary to implement a comprehensive national regulatory program. Which in this case was the Controlled Substances Act. Justice Scalia did not join the majority opinion, but concurred only in its result. Nor did he adopt the government's market substitute theory of economic activity. Instead, he stressed that unlike the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which was invalidated in Lopez, the CSA could regulate even non-economic activity because it was essential to its broader regulatory scheme. Furthermore, he stressed that this doctrine derives from the Necessary and Proper Clause. So the court was required to defer to Congress's assessment that reaching such local conduct is necessary or essential. Quote, Congress could reasonably conclude, he wrote, 
that its objective of prohibiting local marijuana from the interstate market could be undercut if those activities were accepted from its general scheme of regulation. Note that in Raich, Justice Scalia found that the CSA was both necessary and proper to regulate the interstate drug market. In contrast, in Prince, he found that the Brady Act provision may have been necessary to regulate the interstate firearms market, but was not a proper means of doing so because it impinged on state sovereignty. We will study Prince versus United States in a future topic. In her dissenting opinion, Justice O'Connor rejected the court's broad definition of economic, which she said, quote, threatens to sweep all of productive human activity into federal regulatory reach. Quoting from NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel, Justice O'Connor objected to the court's use of, quote, a dictionary definition of economics to skirt the real problem of drawing a meaningful line between what is national and what is local. She also questioned the courts and Justice Scalia's deference to Congress's claim that reaching such activity was essential to its regulatory scheme. Quote, if the court always defers to Congress as it does today, little may be left to the notion of enumerated powers. Chief Justice Rehnquist, who was too ill from cancer to attend oral argument and who participated in the deliberations by telephone, joined Justice O'Connor's dissent. He died just a few months after the court announced his decision in Raich. Justice Thomas also dissented. In his separate opinion, he urged, as he had in both Lopez and Morrison, that the court should abandon the substantial effects test altogether because it was not consistent with the original meaning of Congress's enumerated powers. Quote, Respondents Diane Monson and Angel Raich use marijuana that has never been bought or sold, has never crossed state lines, and has had no demonstrable effect on the national market for marijuana. If Congress can regulate this under the Commerce Clause, then it can regulate virtually anything, and the federal government is no longer one of limited and enumerated powers. Let's conclude by returning to our brief history of implied powers. Lopez and Morrison represented an effort to put the brakes on any further expansion of New Deal and Warren Court doctrines governing implied federal powers. Now, Congress could only regulate intrastate activity that had a substantial effect on interstate commerce if the activity was economic in nature. However, by allowing Congress to reach even non-economic activity as part of a broader regulatory scheme, Raich seemed to exceed the powers the New Deal Court had recognized in Wickard. As I stated at the opening of my oral argument, if the court accepts either of the government's rationales for reaching homegrown marijuana, Gonzalez versus Raich will replace Wickard versus Filburn as the most far-reaching example of Commerce Clause authority over intrastate activity. And so it did. After Raich, one might have agreed with Justice Thomas that there was no activity Congress could not regulate so long as it was an essential part of a larger regulatory scheme. But then, in 2010, Congress passed another comprehensive regulatory scheme called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Okay, uh, I thought what I, we would do is we would take uh, some questions now, and, but before I do, I just wanted to, um, first of all, I wanted to thank Josh for what he, the work he's done on these videos. So I want to talk a little bit about the production process that went into making them, uh, just a second. So the way we work this, and it did take over two years to produce these videos, is that uh, Josh, would do, that moment. Josh would do a first draft uh, of the script, which was basically based on the casebook text that we'd worked on together. Um, I would then edit it. We went back and forth numerous times. I, you know, I consumed two summers of my research that I would normally depend on other, the, uh, do other things on script writing. Um, and then we went into the studio, uh, which was out in Chantilly, Virginia, and we would stand in front of a green screen um, and read the scripts. Which, hours straight, basically. Yeah, which was not, which is not easy to do. So we would read every script twice just to make sure we had two takes of everything, but we were constantly having to stop because we misspoke and we said the words wrong or we read the thing wrong. Uh, and so it didn't look like that when we did it. We, this was a compilation of stuff. Uh, and then after that was done, 
then Josh actually did all the post-production work, which is all the graphics and illustrations and the storyboards. Uh, that's entirely Josh's work, um, where uh, we would have you know all the things that illustrate the different levels of governmental power or the pictures that he would provide. And so this is all his stuff, although I did uh, have input after he had done it, but the actual uh, moving force behind it. And you'll notice from the tiles that you saw on the website of each case, what, there was a photograph or something behind every case name. That was a, one of the photographs that's in the videos that Josh found to illustrate either the location or the person um, or something like that. Or in the case of Ollie's Barbecue, a ma matchbooks from a matchbook from Ollie's Barbecue that Who Josh found that matchbook. That Josh eBay. On so, eBay. Fun fact. Ollie's Barbecue was a case of whether a barbecue in Birmingham was engaged in interstate commerce. I found on eBay a map of Ollie's Barbecue that was manufactured in Atlanta. Proof. They had goods from out of state. <laughs> so, um, with, with that, um, <laughs> do you guys uh, have any comments or questions? It's, we're going to take this till 1 o'clock and then you'll all be free to go. So, any comments, questions? Yes. I have a, a question for Professor Blackman, actually, on the lines line of the Aldi barbecue. I understand you have a collection of Supreme Court memorabilia. I do. Can you tell us about that and how oh my God. is it for this video series? Oh, you are you are too generous. Um, so the question you couldn't hear in the back was, uh, uh, do you have a question of Supreme Court memorabilia? I do. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. I have no cons about it. Um, you will be amazed when eBay turns up. Oh, oh no. What they have until it's gone. <laughs> uh, one of our favorite cases is Carolyn Products, which is about the scope of uh, the court review on the due process clause. Um, I have an entire case of Milnock, which is basically this, this, this uh, uh, Bill Mill that was prohibited. I have these cookbooks from the 1930s from Carolyn Products. Um, crazy story, I got in touch with the, the granddaughter of the president of the company. She found my blog out of the blue with this long conversation. And she told these great stories, which I didn't know. In fact, Randy didn't know them either. Did you know that the courts? Actually declared the Bill Milk Act unconstitutional. Decades later, a district court in Illinois had a district court decision where they said it was irrational. They won. They won the case. <laughs> Another great story that the president of the company drove a mill truck into West Virginia across state lines to trigger the federal statute. That's what the case was. He was saying, I want you to come after me. Even better story. After the case was over, he received a pardon for Franklin Roosevelt. Shortly before Roosevelt's death. About two weeks before Roosevelt died. His, and the funny part is, he was a Republican guy. They hang up in the bathroom of the men's club. That's the Roosevelt part. The other nice fact about that is that it, once, after the decision was made in order to maintain the interstate uh, barrier, they built a plant on the state line. Yeah. And they had a brass rail that yep. ran through the center of the plant that indicated what the state line was. And so some activities would take place on one side of the, uh, the brass rail, and some activities would take place on the other side. Uh, but I, I have a spike from the Railroad. Um, I have uh, yearbooks of Justice O'Connor and Rehnquist and Ginsburg and Scalia or high school yearbooks. Uh, Ginsburg was a twirler. Who knew? Right? Um, we're, we're lucky we did this. Pro we started this project before Josh got married. Yeah. Because well, uh, he, he would not have the time to I put have, into uh, this now that he. I, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate in that. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Other questions? Um, so in addition to these cases that you've outlined uh, from previous courts, are there any cases that you're tracking right now, whether that have been granted cert or that might be moving through the, the federal courts uh, that you think could be particularly relevant? Any? I'll let, uh, you're, the well, court, you're the court watcher. Let me put it this way. Um, we often get carried away with the moment, right, that there's a case decided now. It's like, oh, my God, this is a big case. But... We may not talk about it in another couple of years. And one of the projects we have to do here is what case has staying power, right? What case decided now will actually be important in 10 or 20 years? And let me tell you something. Most cases are utterly irrelevant. Like an example, the travel ban case, Trump versus the wife. That was like the biggest thing in the world, and now it's like, oh, whatever. It won't even go into our Facebook. It's not that important. You know, a case like um, Noel Canning, which I thought was a huge case, uh, which was a recent appointment. I don't think it's important anymore. The filibuster has gone, right? Other events can change which render old presence not super important. And when you talk about the canon, what will people be reading in 20 years from now? Most of these cases aren't that important. On the current docket, um, there's a Second Amendment case from New York, which I think is probably a cost of mootness. Uh, there's the case about the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, from that funding the tax credits for those schools, that actually may, may have some staying power. Not in accordance with more of a cookies call and establishment clause. Um, the case on DACA, I think, will be a flip. This will just be a one off. Trump get rid of it. I don't know much staying power. Um, if an abortion case comes up and it doesn't leave the case, that might have staying power because it's the first post end of the abortion case in you know, three decades. Um, but we try not to get carried away. You know, these are 100 cases. What will number 101 be? I don't know. Maybe another five years we'll add a couple more. I, 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 don't, I, I, I really don't know. But we have to let something digest and marinate for it before you say, okay, this is a case that wants to know. And, and the, what makes these cases teach, teach worthy, uh, teaching worthy um, is that it's understanding these cases that lets you interpret both predict what courts are likely to do, what the majority, what the left side of the court wants to do, what the right side of the court wants to do, and to detect significant cases because they are going to reaffirm or challenge something that has come before. So it orients you uh, the way that constitutional lawyers are already oriented because they have actually internalized all these cases. Uh, these, you may not have heard of most of these cases, but all constitutional lawyers who do this for a living, they know these cases. Um, they could talk about them at the drop of a hat. Um, and that's the reason, and that's how they orient themselves. They're like the, they're like the stars in the heavens when you're navigating uh, a ship. This is how constitutional lawyers navigate and by these Scalia stars. Points north always. What points north? Scalia. <laughs> <laughs> Scalia voted against immigration. Thomas is almost always true north. Just uh, maybe of course it's not your flowers. I don't know. What's <laughs> I had to spend hours in the studio with this guy. <laughs> Is hours. We did. We, what do you think? Sixty or eighty hours? Spent about seventy hours in the studio. And just by the way, reading my teleprompter is very hard. It looks easy, but you see like a newscaster on TV. When you read, your eyes go left to right. When your eyes go left to right, camera looks right. So actually, try and read something without moving your eyes. It's hard. Watch my Marbury video. I screwed up, but I got better after that. <laughs> you mentioned that you originally had one hundred and three cases. What were the other three? <laughs> Not All right, so don't tell anyone they're actually 103 in the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't want to cut them, so we just made the title 100. And I think the title's good enough. Yeah, count 103. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are a couple of cases that aren't quite as important. The 11th Amendment and Sovereign Immunity, like Nevada, Department of Human Resources versus Kids, and Karen versus Alabama. Do the other ones, which are not like super important, but they're part, they're part of the part. You need to know the entire part. So when I do my 100 count on Twitter, I love it. Thread 100 deep with every single trailer for Virginia. Yep. I will not include those, so it will be 100, but the book actually about 103. And there are a couple chapters which aren't even cases. For example, we have a case a chapter on sedition, the LA Sedition Act. There were no cases on that. Uh, we have a chapter on uh, slavery and construction. Uh, the Civil War happened, it wasn't an extreme court case. So we have some historical chapters that don't even correspond to it. So it's not a perfect 100, but it's a good question. But it's close enough. Thank you. Uh, over the historical arc of this of, uh, of your chronology here, uh, what would you say is the trend between cases which uphold the law, cases which strike down the law, and what that says about the court and activism in the street? Uh, before we answer that, I just want, I thought of something earlier. Just so you know, the website which Josh told you about, which was organized chronologically by era, that's not the way the book is actually organized. Yeah. The website, you can click on the website and have this material organized in, in different ways, sort right? By sort by topic, sort chronologically. So the book is, or is generally chronological, but within Con Law 1, and then it's chronological within Con Law 2. So just so you know, that's not actually the organization you get from the book. It is the organization you get but from the book. But within each topic, it's chronological. So if you were in the towel, it's from pre-1842, right. the 1860s, and the rest of the New Deal, and the right was, of course, we can actually see each topic chronologically. And this is the website, conlaw.us. If you go there now, it's like 95% finished. It'll be launching tomorrow, but you can see the bulk of it now. So I don't know if I don't really have a So I don't really have a strong opinion about your in answer to your question about whether they're predominantly upholding or striking down. I, I do think um, that one of the functions, one of the sociological functions of judicial review is to legitimate expansion of federal power or expansion of power. And the way that you, they do that is by upholding. But they're upholding, the act of upholding wouldn't legitimate unless there's a threat of invalidation as well. So they've got, I'm not saying they think this way. But 
it's the way the system functions. You have to invalidate a certain number of them so that when you uphold something, it's then considered to be significant. And that is part of the process by which federal power has expanded over 200 years. It's the upholdings that have been far more significant in, uh, than I think than the invalidations have been. And, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're the ones that, I uh, that caused me to be very discouraged about constitutional law when I was a law student. I took constitutional law and I went through the casebook and I would get to a part of the Constitution that sounded good to me, like the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. You would think that that was an extremely important provision. Then you turn the page of the casebook and you say, oh no, forget about that. We're going to uphold the law. Forget about that. Now forget about this other one. Forget about the Commerce Clause. Forget about the Nuts and Proper Clause. Forget about the Second Amendment. Forget about this. Forget about that. And by the time I was done with con law, I was done with con law. And I went on to be a criminal lawyer, and then I went on to be a contracts professor, and only got dragged back into constitutional law very reluctantly and over a period of time. And now look at me. Look at me now. I'm totally, totally ruined uh, back, back in con law. Keep in mind, state laws are involved also. So Pritchard, Pennsylvania, Declared a state liberty law that protected slaves on constitutional held the federal law. So it's not simple to strike down the poll. Is, is it in the state regulated or the fed? It's another balance to think about. Quick questions. One once, twice. We'll be happy to sign the book. Seriously, this is your chance to buy it. Amazon back order for like at least a month. Not not be specious. Uh, thank you all so much. Thanks for coming.